Tonight, left for dead, a food delivery rider killed in Port Melbourne. A car dealership worker arrested after fleeing the scene. Breaking news, we hear from the young Australian girl who survived a vicious stabbing in London. How Taylor Swift gave her strength. Sports stars left heartbroken over the sudden death of a popular journalist. America's ultimate power couple sends Democrats into a frenzy over Kamala Harris. Sarah's secret, how a Melbourne mum lost 100 kilos in a year. And a bomber's backflip, stalwart Dyson Heppel, given a farewell game. Live from Melbourne, 7 News with Peter Mitchell starts now. Good evening. Seven News can reveal a drink driver accused of running down a food delivery rider in Port Melbourne was a car dealership worker who'd borrowed a customer's car for the night. Police claim the driver took off after the crash, leaving the victim for dead. A food delivery rider killed while trying to earn a living. It's tragedy after tragedy in the gig economy. Police say a black Audi SUV collided with the cyclist on Plummer Street just after 8pm. The driver allegedly fled the scene before handing himself into police. We have these incidents night after night. Uh, it's on a weekly basis where uh, we have a collision and uh, the driver's failing to stop. Sadly, the 27-year-old Southbank man couldn't be saved. He didn't have anything with him, so it looks like he's finished his deliveries for the night and uh, potentially is just riding home. Seven News understands the Audi driver is a worker at a luxury car dealership. He's taken a customer's car home for the night before being unexpectedly asked to bring it back. That's when the incident happened. This is the 18th worker that has died on the job in the food delivery gig economy and it actually is now a national crisis. The union has previously made workers compensation claims for families of riders killed on the job who were unable to access the same compensation as employees in other industries. These are workers that don't have any minimum standards, they don't have a minimum wage, uh, they don't have the right to challenge an unfair sacking. The 32-year-old from Port Melbourne has been charged with drink driving and failing to stop and assist after an accident. He'll face court tomorrow. Ainsley Kosh, 7 News. There's been a major update in the case of accused mushroom killer Erin Patterson. Rochelle Brown has the details. Rochelle, a trial date has been set. Mitch, it will be held in April next year near her home in the Latrobe Valley. It comes after Miss Patterson's defence team won their argument to have the case heard locally rather than at Melbourne in the Supreme Court. The 49-year-old is facing three counts of murder over the deaths of father-in-law Don and mother-in-law Gail Patterson and Gail's sister, Heather Wilkinson. All three died in hospital after consuming a beef wellington lunch allegedly laced with poisonous mushrooms in July last year. Miss Patterson is also accused of the attempted murder of Ian Wilkinson, who attended the lunch but survived, and the attempted murder of her ex-husband, Simon. Now, Miss Patterson has pleaded not guilty to all of the charges. Mitch? Rochelle Brown at police headquarters. Thank you. An 11-year-old Australian girl stabbed in London is finally back home tonight, bravely telling her story for the first time. Layla Johnson was on a dream holiday with her mum to see Taylor Swift when a daytime walk almost turned deadly. Happy and smiling 11-year-old Layla Johnson is finally back home near Bega. It was bad to meet them under that circumstance, but there are some people that I will remember forever. She was on the holiday of her young life, travelling, watching the Matildas, uh, yeah, and a dream to see Taylor Swift, but it almost turned deadly, stabbed at random by a man in Leicester Square. And we just came out of the Lego store um, when she was um, jumped on quite suddenly and, yeah, did not see it coming, didn't suspect anything, obviously. Her attacker stopped by a brave security guard. I jumped on him, hold the hand in which he wasn't having a knife, and I just put him down on the floor and just hold him and kick the knife away from him. He's just one of many she now wants to thank. There were so many people in hospital and after hospital just that 
made me feel so much more safe. She's been recovering for more than a week. Australian consular officials even making certain she got to see Taylor Swift before returning home on Sunday and straight on to a stage show of her own. She's the one that's kept everyone else um, afloat, I guess. Uh, she's the most optimistic kid you could meet. Andrew Denny, 7 News. AFL coaches are leading tributes for Sam Landsberger after the Herald Sun journalist was killed in a road tragedy in Richmond. He was hit by a truck at a notorious intersection that locals have been worried about for years. A star scribe gone too soon. Sam Landsberger died after he was hit by a truck. The Herald Sun writer gracing his final front page today. Tragic news yesterday. In a really tragic... Um, set of circumstances. An award-winning journalist pinned as a future leader. The 35-year-old was the son of former Western Bulldogs Dr Jake, the club sharing its support for the Landsberger family. Love to you Jake and, and Ian and uh, we're thinking of you. Sam's colleagues at Fox Footy paying their respects. Anyone who came across Sam it realises that he's a lovely person. His final moments were at this Richmond intersection. The driver of the truck that killed him stopped and helped and tested negative to roadside drug and alcohol tests. But he allegedly refused a blood test and has been banned from driving. Regardless of the outcome of the police investigation into the death of Sam Landsberger, locals are worried about the safety of the intersection. In 2013, a 14-year-old girl was killed there and traffic light sequencing is an issue. Drivers get a green light two seconds before pedestrians get a green man, meaning drivers turning left could easily think they don't need to give way to pedestrians, only for the pedestrian light to change moments later. It's just been dangerous for many, many years. I always stand back with the pram. 7 News isn't suggesting the delay has anything to do with Sam Landsberger's death. Rory Campbell, 7 News. Jetstar is facing legal action over its refusal to refund COVID travel credits. Class action lawyers claim the budget airline owes millions of dollars to hundreds of thousands of travellers. Grounded planes meant grounded refunds. Four years later, some customers still don't have their money back, so they're taking Jetstar to the federal court. And those people were legally entitled to simply get their money back as a refund. Instead, Jetstar passengers were sent credit vouchers with strict conditions on their use. This new class action will try to force outstanding refunds and seek compensation for holding the money so long. If you think about these hundreds of millions of dollars that Jetstar unlawfully held, for years, at any ordinary interest rate, this is a huge amount of money. For a huge number of people, potentially hundreds of thousands, it's the same law firm running a similar case against Qantas. One year in, that's headed towards mediation. What's stopping you from refunding the money just directly? I don't expect um, all of you have run an airline to understand the complexity in an airline ticketing system. When we asked today, Jetstar wouldn't reveal how much it was holding in outstanding COVID credits. We removed expiry dates for COVID vouchers so they can be used indefinitely, Jetstar told us. They can be used across multiple bookings and for multiple people. Jetstar itself has been a bit slippery about the exact number of, of credits it issued and the exact value of them all. What we can say is the value of those credits was in the hundreds of millions of dollars. And across international and domestic flights, passengers will join the class action automatically if they were given credit for a cancelled flight between 2020 and 2022. Blake Johnson, 7 News. A Melbourne woman has avoided jail for her role in a mother-daughter drug syndicate. South Sada Sankanoni was sentenced to a 12-month community corrections order after mailing hundreds of drug-fuelled parcels that had been packed by her daughter. South Sada, did you really not know what was in the packages? San Sanacone's daughter is already serving 17 years behind bars. Misbehaving federal politicians could soon be fined up to 5% of their salary, booted from powerful committees and even suspended from Parliament. The Albanese government hopes to have new laws passed by October. 
Almost three years after the Set the Standard review and after a civil court found Brittany Higgins was raped in a ministerial office more than four years ago. This parliament should serve as a model workplace for our nation. But doesn't. Heckling, bullying, shouting, intimidation. I've never seen the behaviour that I see particularly in the chamber in any other workplace in my entire life. Senator David Van accused of sexual harassment, Liberal MP Karen Andrews subjected to it by a colleague, ministers having affairs with staffers, most still in Parliament, but in almost any other job would have been sacked. It's different for members of Parliament, so they are essentially employed by their electorates. And can only be voted out but under a new workplace code of conduct will now face fines of up to 5% of their salaries, about $11,000 and more. Suspension, um, removal from a parliamentary committee. An independent parliamentary standards commission to investigate complaints against politicians, staffers, bureaucrats and journalists with powers to name and shame and recommend action by Parliament's Privileges Committee. But that still means they can't be sacked and the process won't be entirely independent. Politicians ultimately passing judgment on politicians. I definitely think they should be setting the standards, yeah. Everyone needs a code of conduct in their workplace. These are the representatives of our country and everyone should be held by the law. Especially those who make the laws. Mark Riley, Seven News. Australian tennis star Nick Kyrgios has hit out at anti-doping bosses after world number one Yannick Sinner escaped a drug ban. The Italian tested positive to steroids twice earlier this year, but a tribunal accepted they were accidentally absorbed. Kyrgios slammed the decision, telling Sinner he should be gone for two years. His performance was enhanced. Sinner was instead stripped of more than $480,000 prize money and 400 ranking points. Barack and Michelle Obama have sent the Democratic Convention in Chicago into meltdown. America's most powerful political couple threw their support behind Kamala Harris while delighting in painting Donald Trump as an unhinged villain. America, hope is making a comeback. <laughs> the former first lady commanding the crowd. There is no other choice than Kamala Harris and Tim Walls. No other choice. Warning what the Democrat nominee will face. Donald Trump did everything in his power to try to make people fear us. Who's going to tell him that the job he's currently seeking might just be one of those black jobs? Warming up the crowd for the man who made it so. America's 44th president, her husband, Barack Obama. One of the most influential Democrats, his election made history. I'm feeling fired up. Now throwing his support behind a candidate who could follow his path. America's ready for a new chapter. America's ready for a better story. We are ready for a president, Kamala Harris. The symmetry unmistakable. America's first black president now asking Americans to elect for the first time a black woman as president. Party faithful throwing a boisterous roll call. The candidates beaming into the convention on a big screen. And hello to everyone joining us from exciting Chicago. A two state show of strength as the nominees campaigned in Wisconsin. This is a people powered campaign. In Chicago, Tim Lester, Seven News. A crash outside police headquarters on the corner of La Trobe and Spencer Street today caused traffic mayhem in the city and docklands during the morning peak. A driver suffered a medical episode colliding with a police vehicle before taking out a traffic light control box. The driver and police officers were not hurt. A Victorian man enraged by his wife's attempts to leave him has tracked his family to Sydney to unleash a shocking shooting rampage. He opened fire on his elderly in-laws before shooting an innocent man. Through a shattered window, a broken family, traumatised but alive. I'm very thankful that we are not looking at another tragic 
domestic violence homicide. A 50-year-old Victorian man smashed into this Auburn home searching for his estranged wife and two children. And the woman was seeking refuge there for a short time as part of planning separation from her husband. But nowhere was safe. Armed with a gun, her ex took aim at her elderly father. The gun jammed. He fired at his mother-in-law. Luckily, he missed. Some people were shouting and, uh, and just after that uh, I heard uh, the gunshot. He then turned on strangers, attempting to carjack one woman, then a man, shooting him in front of his teenage daughter, leaving him seriously injured. A shot has been fired into the car through the driver's window, impacting the right shoulder and facial area of the driver. The gunman then turned his weapon on himself. His body found on a nearby riverbank. It is scary. Police in New South Wales last had interactions with the man 35 years ago. He hasn't had any run-ins with Victoria Police in a decade. Investigators say there was nothing about this family that would cause any immediate concern. Tonight, they are just relieved innocent lives weren't lost. Bill Hogan, 7 News. Australians who create and share deep fake pornography could spend up to six years in jail after new laws passed through federal parliament. A deep fake is an image or video which digitally manipulates an individual's likeness to show them performing an act they haven't done. The practice has been on the rise on social media with the evolution of artificial intelligence. The Socceroos will host a blockbuster qualifier at Amy Park in the lead-up to the 2026 World Cup. Australia will take on Saudi Arabia in November. The last time we lost a World Cup qualifier down here in Melbourne was 1977. So it's always been an area, a stadium that the boys enjoy coming to. Melbourne fans bring a football, if I can say that, a football atmosphere. Tickets go on sale tomorrow. Tim's here now with a look ahead to sport and Tim the Bombers have changed their tune. They have Mooch Essendon fans now have one last chance to farewell a club champion that's coming up. Also, the exclusive interview revealing a shock trade twist. We go one-on-one -on -one with Tom Hawkins about his September plans, Bulldogs coach Luke Beveridge and his left field comparisons. I'll get myself into trouble here, whether it's a salamander or a chameleon or, a, or it's just your... Your garden variety lizard. <laughs> and the Premiership star has hung up the boots, Mitch. That's all coming up. They change colours, do they? He's always entertaining. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. Billionaire Mike Cannon-Brooks has just been given the green light to build Australia's biggest solar farm. What it means for power prices is next on 7 News. Also ahead, a fire emergency unfolds on the Westgate Bridge. Bye-bye, Benefer. Why Hollywood's biggest couple is calling it quits. And coming up later, the new rules to let Melbourne workers ignore their boss. A car erupted in flames on the Westgate Bridge this morning. The fire forced two lanes to close in both directions around 5.30am. Crews managed to contain the inferno within six minutes. Traffic was forced to slow to 40 kilometres an hour before the scene was cleared. An Australian billionaire has been given the green light to build the world's biggest solar farm. The bold plan from Mike Cannon-Brooks will help Australia sell energy to Singapore, but experts are questioning its viability. Australia's tech tycoon Mike Cannon-Brooks at the site of his Atlassian Empire's future Australian headquarters. <laughs> Celebrating the halfway point of the construction of what will be the world's tallest hybrid timber and steel office tower. Looking forward to 2027 when we can um, actually move in. While another of his ambitious projects hits a major milestone of its own, the federal government giving environmental approval to the Sun Cable venture. This is Australia's largest ever renewable energy project. A bold plan to turn an old pastoral station in the heart of the Northern Territory into a massive solar farm, transporting electricity first to Darwin via 800 kilometres of overhead transmission lines, then on to Singapore through 4,300 kilometres of subsea cables. It's looking for a very significant amount of electricity to power 
um, artificial intelligence, uh, software, big data banks. Developing the world's first intercontinental grid. A decade-long initiative to try to make a huge change in Australia's export industry. But significant doubts remain about the viability of the multi-billion dollar project, with a final investment decision not expected until 2027. I wouldn't be betting my house on Sun Cable coming off. Rob Scott, 7 News. Opting in to a subscription can be easy, but it's often complicated to opt out. The Consumer Policy Research Centre found 75% of Australians have had a negative experience. Companies use subscription traps like complex websites to make it difficult. The Consumer Watchdog is calling for a ban on those unfair methods. Hollywood's most talked about couple has called it quits again. Jennifer Lopez filed for divorce from Ben Affleck just two years after their fairy tale wedding. And splitting up their epic fortune could get messy. Just last year, this documentary celebrated what they called the greatest love story never told. You don't know how much to give, how much to reveal. Ben and Jen never say never to divorce, as it turns out. It's hardly a surprise. I mean, the speculation has gone on for months. They secretly split back in April. If I'm going to fail, I want to at least have a chance to fail on my own. You don't need to worry about Ben, let me just tell you. But J-Lo made it official today on their second anniversary. You'd have to say she's making some sort of statement by doing that. J-Lo filed the documents on her own, like she literally put on an outfit and went down to the court by herself. It's their second try at love. The first time ended in tears too, almost 20 years ago. A preview to this latest train wreck. They got married for love. They didn't care about the money, but now they're going to have to worry about the money. Even if you were broke, Well, that's not true. The couple doesn't have a prenup, so lawyers will have to carve up their fortune, thought to be around a billion Australian dollars. Well, this is so crazy, right? I mean, celebrities of this level not having a prenup? Starting with their $100 million home. I'm still, I'm still Jenny from the block. Used to have a little, now I have a lot. Just not love. In Hollywood, Miley Hogan, 7 News. Jane Bunn joins us now. And, Jane, that was quite a cloudburst mid-afternoon. <laughs> Rich, it did. It came, it delivered, and it rapidly moved on. One shower grew as it moved through the city and eastern suburbs, growing into a thunderstorm but only affecting those in its path. Another one followed, this one in through here, that one for the north with more hit and miss activity this evening. The downpour has more bark than bite, not adding up to much in the rain gauge. The city had four millimetres in the past week, 3.4 this afternoon, well short of the August average. Earlier it reached 19 in the city, four above average. There are even warmer days in the outlook. I'll have more after sport, Mitch. Looking forward to that. Thank you, Jane. Victoria's TAFE teachers are fed up taking strike action for the first time in more than a decade, with a promise of more to come. Also ahead on 7 News, new clues at sea in the race to find a missing billionaire. The tragic reason King Charles has paused his summer holidays. And a golden dream comes true for Australia's youngest ever Olympic champion. Victorian TAFE teachers have run out of patience, taking strike action for the first time in more than a decade. They walked off the job today as their two-year pay fight escalates. TAFE teachers claim they've been dudded, treated like second-class citizens compared with secondary school teachers. I'm not paid the same. I do the same job. I've got less hours to do it. They're angry. Increasing workloads, increasing cost of living, stagnant pay. Claiming a lack of funding is hurting students. Our kids deserve an education. They haven't had a wage rise for two years. $13,000 less than TAFE teachers in the ACT, $5,000 less than TAFE teachers in Western Australia. They've rejected a 3% annual pay rise, an offer in line with Victoria's wages policy. Oh, oh. 3% has got to go! This is our chance to let government know that what they are offering is not good enough. The union believes the government can cough up more. We believe they have that money. The impact on the Victorian economy if they don't address this issue is huge. 
we already know how difficult it is to get a plumber, a builder. We're negotiating in good faith with our TAFE teachers. I'm not going to cut across those negotiations to draw comment on the action they're taking today. The union says a recent survey of its members found 70% had considered quitting at a time when Victorian TAFEs are grappling with a workforce shortage. Teachers have voted to ramp up their industrial action. Emma O'Sullivan, 7 News. New video shows the moment a luxury yacht sank off Sicily. The lights of the vessel can be seen slowly sinking into the water. The search for missing British billionaire Mike Lynch and five others is entering a third day. Divers have opened up the hull 50 metres below the surface but can't move inside because of furniture blocking the way. King Charles has paused his summer holidays to spend time with victims of the shocking stabbing attack that claimed the lives of three children. The monarch travelled to Southport in the north of England where he was welcomed by huge crowds. It could have been a sombre occasion, but the monarch's visit brought cheer to a community still in mourning. King Charles arrived in Southport to a sea of local faces, slowly inspecting the town's floral memorial site that still grows. Three weeks ago at a Taylor Swift dance class, three young girls were killed and many more injured in a random stabbing attack. A tragedy that left the country in shock and sparked a violent response as riots rocked the UK. This visit, a healing step. Inside the town hall, the King privately met young survivors and heroes like John Hayes, stabbed when he ran into the class to help. I've said hello to the King. They met some of the children's parents. You know, it was lovely to see them. And beyond that, I just really want to try and put my life back together. Charles will continue his summer holiday pause and travel back here to London, where he's invited the families of those three victims to Buckingham Palace, a chance for the King to offer his own personal sympathies. From a King to a Queen of Pop, Taylor Swift also inviting the families to her last London concert. Two powerful meetings to help the healing. In London, Joel Dry, 7 News. Australia's youngest ever Olympic gold medalist has finally received the prize she most desired after carving out history in Paris. Skateboarder Arissa True was promised a pet duck from her parents if she won gold. Today, the 14-year-old was presented with the duck live on Gold Coast Radio before confirming she plans to take her new pet for walks to the local skate park. Melbourne workers are about to get new powers, giving them the right to ignore the boss. Details are next on 7 News. Also ahead, the law catches up with an accused doll thief. He's been claiming benefits for years while living a life of luxury. The two major reasons why Australians are pushing back their retirement and how the spirit of Tasmania is taking a leaf out of Noah's Ark. Tonight's edition of The Nightly is out now. Australia's only digital newspaper to drop nightly. Free to your device every weeknight. Spend your night wisely at thenightly.com.au. A man on unemployment benefits for five years has been busted with a blue Lamborghini, a Harley Davidson and two Rolex watches. Detectives investigating unexplained wealth raided a Western Sydney unit last month, discovering the assets worth more than half a million dollars. The 39-year-old has been charged and faces court in October. Melbourne workers will soon have the right to switch off from emails and phone calls outside work hours. The new right to disconnect law comes into effect on Monday, but not everyone's convinced. If you've ever wanted to ignore this call, now's your time. I think, you know, as long as you're... Um Getting the work done within you know those hours, you shouldn't be kind of getting those calls. To be honest with you, I see no need as to why they would need me to do extra work. From Monday, employees of businesses with over 15 workers have the right to disconnect after work. So it gives employees a, a peace of mind that they're legally protected. 
uh, if they don't respond to messages outside their paid work hours. It's not illegal for managers to contact employees whenever they wish, but it gives employees the right to refuse to monitor, read or respond to emails or phone calls from their employer or anyone work-related. Companies caught breaching the rules can face fines of almost $20,000. Determining whether an employee's refusal is reasonable, we'll have to see how those factors uh, work in practice. Similar laws have been adopted in 25 countries, including France. Some Australian companies, like Luxury Escapes, already ahead of the curve. And we've certainly never had an issue. And there's certain people who would never, never contact outside hours and certain people who would want to be contacted outside hours. So, again, the need to legislate for this sort of thing just makes no sense at all. Melina Saris, 7 News. Higher insurance premiums and power bills are making it harder than ever for Australians to retire. Consumer Affairs Editor Georgia Holland explains. The latest data from ASFA paints a worrying picture for retirees. A couple aged 65 now needs $73,000 per year to have a comfortable retirement. A single requires $52,000. Over the past 12 months, the cost of retiring has climbed 3.7%, causing the most pressure, household insurance premiums up 14% on last year, electricity prices up 6% and groceries up nearly 4%. Having enough money to last your retirement is a big concern, but ASFA says the super system is there to help. Voluntary contributions can make a real difference to how comfortably you're able to live once you finish work. Georgia Holland reporting. A Melbourne mother is sharing her incredible weight loss journey after she dropped 100 kilos. <laughs> Perfect. I feel great. I can't believe that. After sport, find out how she did it without the help of drugs like Ozempic. Pets will soon be able to travel in comfort across Bass Strait. The Spirit of Tasmania's new ships will include 18 pet-friendly cabins with outdoor areas as well as 42 kennels, separate from the vehicle deck. We fully expect that these 18 cabins will be uh, booked every sailing. Uh, the, the demand is certainly there for those and people should not be disappointed if they can't get their cabins because the normal kennel has been totally upgraded as well. The new ships are expected to start operating between Geelong and Devonport next year. Tim's here with Sport and Tim the Magpies already have an eye on next season. They do, Mitch. They're putting more stars in cotton wool for their last game. We'll tell you who next. Also, one last farewell for a Bombers champ while a teammate reveals his one in a million injury shock. Here exclusively from Tom Hawkins on his September plans. The Bulldogs make a call on their Ruckman for the final round and our Aussie sprint sensation eyeing more Olympic gold. On 7 News, instant millionaires. So congratulations. Brilliant, 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 brilliant. Are you serious? Victoria's luckiest lotto locations revealed. Plus, the AFL Fun Factory, where Melbourne's new footy play centre will be built. Only on 7 News at 6. Welcome back. Essen midfielder Dylan Schill has revealed the toll of an off-season injury as he weighs up his future. While the Bombers will farewell Dyson Heppel on Saturday after an outcry, it was a week too late. One final goodbye. Thank you very much. Good on you. Bombers fans will get to see Dyson Heppel don the sash in Brisbane. But Brad Scott is making no apologies for overlooking his departing veteran when their season was on the line. My job is to get Essendon back to, to playing and winning finals. We won't let anything stand in the way of that in terms of, and that includes sentiment. In terms of a leader, there's, there's not many guys walking around that can really inspire a group you know, when, you know, during really tough times. More decisions coming at Tullamarine. Jake Stringer still without a contract. Todd Goldstein's future in limbo. Everything's on the table for us. I mean, we're going to continue to keep working to improve our list and we need to improve our list. She'll fit again after off-season foot surgery, which was compounded by a knee setback at home. Playing with my young daughter, playing with someone with blocks and that on the ground and just... Uh, clicked, the knee sort of clicked and popped and um, yeah, managed to tear my meniscus. Certainly challenges the um, your character and you know the, the want to, to keep backing up day after day. A year left on his contract. I joined the club six years ago and the dream is and still is to 
finish my career here at Essendon. He admits the Saints will leave him with a call to make. They were certainly interested last year and my understanding is, you know, I'm not oblivious to the news that um, they're obviously interested again as well. So, yeah, we'll, we'll see. I'm not going to deny, deny, deny when it's clearly happening. Mitch Cleary, 7 News. The Magpies have all but shut up shop for 2024, conceding it's unlikely they'll feature in September. They'll rest a star forward against the Demons this weekend and turn their attention to an off-season recruiting drive. A different look to September. Craig McRae has conceded Collingwood's final dream is all but over. Mass was never my strong, strong suit. I did the Mass that 14 wins would get you in at the start of the year. That was always our goal. Um, looks like that might be the reality. One more opportunity to go out there and put the jumper on with great pride. Four points outside the eight lacking percentage, the Pies would need a miracle. They'd need to beat Melbourne by 100 points and have the Blues lose by 100 points to St Kilda. I think reality of the game, this competition has never been closer. Yeah, you know, like we might miss the finals and be two, two or three wins off second or third. Scott Pendlebury likely to miss. He's nursing an elbow injury and has admitted he played through two broken ribs in his 400th game. Dan McStay won't play, pulling up sore. The Pies hoping they can find him some assistance in the forward line come next year. We've got Dan and, and Checkers who are incredible at what they do, but most teams would be craving for a Kurnow and Mackay in their forward line, wouldn't they? The Dogs anticipating to be without Tim English this week, nursing an ankle injury. Rory Lobb set to step up in his absence. Lobby, he's almost got that attitude that if you cut a leg off, he'll grow it back. And um, I was trying to work out what sort of reptiles I'll get myself into trouble here, whether it's a salamander or a chameleon. The Dogs need a win against the Giants to guarantee their finals appearance. It always it's bloody disappointing if you can't make the most of it. Um, so if we can keep it going by winning this weekend, uh, then we'll capitalise on, on the romanticism in, that we've probably just created over the full course of this year. Kate Massey, 7 News. Tom Hawkins has told 7 News he's no guarantee to make it back for Geelong's finals campaign. Theo Dropolis has the details and Theo, it looms as a huge blow for the Cats. Well, Tim, this is the strongest the 36-year-old has been on his future, saying he just doesn't know if he will return this year. Now, Hawkins is making progress in his recovery, but the left foot that's been the stabiliser for so many of his 794 goals now threatening to end his glittering career. I'd love to be able to um, have a bit more confidence or uh, say with a bit more authority where, when the return date is, but I just unfortunately don't know. So I'm excited by uh, the idea and the prospect, but um, there's still a little bit of work to do. I well, hope he gets back. Now, much love, Cat Zach, too. He's announced he'll retire at the end of the 2024 season. One of three Irishmen to have played in a premiership. He leaves after 166 games for Geelong and 120 for the Blues. Port Adelaide's appealing Dan Houston's five-match ban for his bone-crunching bump on Adelaide's Isaac Rankin. The power argued it should only be worth three matches. And another huge talking point in, in Adelaide after showdown 56 was, of course, Hatgate. After hurling abuse at Matt Crouch, a Port Adelaide fan has since gone to police claiming he was assaulted. That was after the Crow star retaliated by knocking the hat off his head. Certainly capped off a pretty nasty showdown, but Tim, I reckon you might have had worse in your time. <laughs> so, uh, Vic Park was always an interesting visit. <laughs> Aussie freestyle sprinter Kyle Chalmers has no plans to retire anytime soon. The 100 metre silver medalist from Paris is eyeing off a fifth Olympic campaign. There is guys that are going to beat me at some point, but hopefully that's after the LA Olympics and then if I make it to LA, then it's a home Olympics in Brisbane 2032. So who knows, I could swim on for the next very long time. Chalmers will be 34 by the time the Brisbane Games roll around. Shane Wawoden and Nick Larkey are the special guests on the front bar at 9 o'clock tonight. Mitch, then it's a massive edition of Talking Footy. Always love going to Victoria Park, by the way. <laughs> yeah, of course you did. Get a shower before you went into the showers. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. And it was cold. <laughs> Melbourne has a new biggest loser after a mother shed a staggering 100 kilos in just 12 months. She achieved the life-changing result without weight loss drugs or surgery, instead taking it back to basics and it's helping keep the weight off. Weighing in at a healthy 87 kilograms, Sarah Parker has lost an incredible 100 kilos in just 12 months without surgery or drugs. Very proud. My face has changed. My body shape has changed. From a size 30 to a size 12, 
after a decade-long struggle. My doctor said, you're going to die <laughs> if we don't sort this out now. High blood pressure, cholesterol and heart rate forcing Sarah to take action, switching to calorie-controlled light and easy meals and daily exercise, seeing her lose the equivalent of two entire people. I am absolutely in awe of her. She's, as I said, she's done such a fantastic job. Deprived of sufficient food as a young child, Sarah binged on comfort carbs. I was diagnosed with PTSD and hunger was my main trigger. Nutrition psychology is a growing area. The 36-year-old, now so healthy, she'll represent Victoria next month in its highest ranking All Abilities netball team. The challenge now is to keep the kilos at bay. Radical weight loss can be difficult to sustain and obesity experts say regular vigorous exercise is just one of the keys to long-term success. Eating a diet that's wholesome, making sure that you get enough sleep and moving as much as you can and as often as you can. Now this weight loss queen wants to become a personal trainer. Jackie Quist, 7 News. Jane's back now with the forecast. And Jane, when are the showers clearing? Mitch, they shouldn't stick around long. We're heading into sunshine. Fitting for tonight's bright side. A field of hope as thousands of flowers flood the city. Again, temperatures dip slightly tomorrow, then we'll head well above average on Friday and the weekend. Today reached 19 in the city before the temperature briefly dropped as a dramatic shower passed through. That brought a few rainbows to those in its path. Dramatic sky and a downpour, but there are generally adding up to just a few millimetres. A big one was followed by another one here crossing northern suburbs, and there are more approaching from the west. We'll have a hit and miss night. In northwesterly winds, we have showers just north of the ranges and in the southwest, increasing this afternoon with the odd thunderstorm as a cold front approaches. This here is the warm side of the front, too warm for snow on the Alps, most reach the high teens. The front passes through later today into tomorrow. Then watch how large the next high pressure system is, where it is sitting and is moving here just out to our east. The passing front means we dip a little in terms of temperature tomorrow, certainly not below average but a bit less than today. It doesn't last to things warm up again as the high moves in, with temperatures peaking over the weekend. In Melbourne there should be plenty of sunshine, but if you're after rain there is more on the way, at times over the weekend and several times next week. Around the nation tomorrow, sunny and 27 in Brisbane, Sydney's grey with the odd light shower. Adelaide has showers in the morning before it clears, Perth is wet, steady rain breaking to showers and storms. To Victoria, patchy fog at first, cloudy with isolated showers and thunderstorms on and north of the ranges and in the southwest. All of that dries up during the afternoon. Still above average, but most are a degree or two cooler than today. Closer in, there's the odd shower left near the northern and eastern ranges in the morning. Otherwise, it's dry. The cloud clears too, with lots of sunshine in light to moderate northwesterly winds. The city is heading for 18 after a cool start. All dry by mid-morning, it's a mostly sunny Thursday. To the eight-day outlook, we're currently experiencing our second warmest August on record and there's still plenty of above average days to come. On Friday, heading for 20, lots of sunshine, a bit of light rain overnight. It's while it's dark, you'll barely see it. We end with a big storm on Sunday afternoon after 23 and 23, lots of showers on Monday. It is 19 for tomorrow, early showers, then we're heading into a mostly sunny day. Now to a very bright, bright side. The daffodil is a symbol of hope and 26,000 of them have flooded the Rialto Towers in the heart of the city. Daffodil Day is our chance to acknowledge all that cancer takes from us and to choose to give back. The official day is tomorrow, 
Visitors can wander through the field of flowers, leaving personal messages on the tribute trees. The flowers are also for sale, with proceeds going directly to the Cancer Council. They're hoping to raise $2.6 million to help with life-saving research. And it was so popular last year, Mitch. The team had to rush out to buy more flowers. They're hoping to see plenty of people through the doors there tomorrow. Good luck to them. Thank you, Jane. Now, here's what's on Sunrise in the morning. Thanks, Mitch. Tomorrow on Sunrise, easing the bite in the cost of living crisis. Expert tips to keep your food fresher for longer. Plus, Bluey's big new announcement and Melbourne music legend Tina Arena live. See you in the morning. And that's the way it is this Wednesday, the 21st of August. Thanks for your company. For now, from the 7 News team, good night. The 7 News app will give you the news you want every minute of every day, including breaking news alerts. Download the 7 News app now.